Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Alliance Church. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who is watching online. Our number of people watching is going way up. I'd like to say a special thank you for the like from Deb. Gee, I wonder who Deb is. Uh, but anyway, we thank you uh, very uh, a lot for tuning in. We've got a few quick announcements. Not a whole lot happening this week, but what is happening is really important. Uh, Tuesday, we've got Trail Life. Uh, Wednesday, of course, we have prayer at 7 o'clock. Saturday, men's prayer. And then at 10 o'clock, as you can see right on the bulletin, is our annual planning meeting. And please, please, come, please. Uh, coffee and tea will be provided. Uh, bring your own treats. I'm never sure how long these go. Usually a couple hours. So, um, oh, Miss Rita, what is the secret word? Glory! Glory, yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, and we'll find out what that's about in just a little bit. So, uh, another announcement, really important. This is your last chance. Check. The directory, the, it's, the, bold, the clipboard is back there at the media booth. Gary is holding it up now. Check your name, address, phone number. We found a couple of mistakes this morning. So we want to make sure next week at the annual planning meeting, the new bulletins will be handed out. Uh, Our directory, yeah, will be handed out next week. So last chance to make sure that your information is correct. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, let me open our worship service with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are our God, that you are here to, uh, uh, for us to worship, for us to bow down before you, for us to, to declare that there is nothing in this world. The problems we face are nothing because you are in control of everything. We just thank you that we can come to you and that we can give you the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
seated. We'd like to take up tithes and offerings at this time. Let me pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your grace, your this poured out upon us, Lord, and you provide everything we need. We can trust you completely that you have our very best at heart. And we just thank you that you have provided so much for us that we have plenty to give back to you. Uh, Accept this offering. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'm going to take this uh, opportunity to introduce Michael. Uh, He is going to give us an elder challenge today. We're going to hear from one of our elders. And so, Michael, you're there. Thank you, sir. Get the right glasses on. Ah, uh, I'm sorry Helen isn't here this morning because I thought I'd start off with uh, some uh, Bible trivia. She, she, Helen, if you're watching online, you can put your answer in the comment. I know that you love my Bible trivia. Uh, so uh, the. I've got, well, I've got a whole page of verses here, but I'll I'll just do three. What do these have in common? Uh, Matthew 6, 33, but first seek the kingdom of, uh, and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you. Okay, what does that have in common with Colossians 1, 26? The mystery that has been hidden for the ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Hmm. Okay, one more. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. They're what? Hmm. They all have to do with the big picture. Okay, now like I said, I, I, you know, I have a whole page of verses, I, could, I just picked three. There are dozens and dozens of verses in the Bible about the big picture. The entire book of, Jonah, or of uh, Job is about the big picture. So uh, what do I mean by the big picture? Let me give you an illustration. Does anybody recognize the name Colonel George Taylor? Uh, well, George Taylor made a kind of famous uh, 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 statement. Uh, let me give you some context. He made this statement back in 1944, back on June 6, 1944. What was that? Huh? D-Day. D-Day, yes. Uh, and I've got a photograph of the beach in Normandy, and right there, in the foreground is Omaha Beach, and Point de Hoc is in the distance there. George Taylor and his men were in the first wave to land on Omaha Beach, the area where the fighting was the worst on D-Day. And the men, the dune that you see there on, on the left-hand side, it, this photograph is 70 years after the battle, so it has eroded a lot. It was about twice that height. The men that made it up onto the beach were all hunkered down behind that dune. The Germans had machine guns on the hill behind them. And as long as they were down uh, below that, that, that dune, the bullets were going right over their heads. They were safe, or so they thought. But that's the situation that Taylor and his men found themselves in when he said, there are two kinds of people who are going, going to be staying on this beach those that are dead, and those that are going to die. Now get off the beach, or words to that effect. 
So, General Taylor saw the big picture. He knew that the men that were on that beach had to get off the beach and get inland and capture some key road junctions because the Germans, if they didn't capture them, the Germans could send reinforcements, including panzer tanks. And if the tanks got to the beach, they could roll right along the beach and annihilate the Allied soldiers. The entire envision would fail if they didn't get off the beach. So <clears throat> that was the big picture. We're soldiers, too. We're soldiers in God's army. And we see what is right in front of us. We don't see the big picture normally. God is in control. He's the general. He knows the plan. It's up to us to trust in him and to get off the beach. Uh, another quote. Robert C. Gerard wrote, this had such an impact on me when I first wrote it. I now have this on the desktop of my computer. I see this every day. I see this multiple times every day. Listen to this, what Gerard wrote. God uses, do any of these apply to you? God uses failure, sickness, breakdown, sin, personal tragedy, and sorrow to reduce his people, that's usens, to usefulness, breaks us down to usefulness, unless a servant of God learns to depend utterly on God and to forsake self-dependence of any kind, he or, or she remains too strong to be of much value. Wow. Self-dependency. Pastor last week was just talking about, you know, uh, how we rely upon ourselves. Gerard says, unless we forsake self-dependency of any kind, we remain too strong to be of much value. So what does that look like? Well, let's take sin. I don't know about you, but I've gone to God many, many times to confess that sin. You know what I'm talking about. It's that one that you, over and over and over. And, you know, my prayer is something like, oh God, I'm sorry, I promise, I won't do it again. I won't do it again. I won't do it again. I won't, I did it again. Does that sound familiar? What's the definition of insanity? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Why then do we keep doing the same thing over and over and again? But it seems like this is common to everybody. Paul, in the book of Romans, wrote, I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. So even Paul struggled with this. And he finally sum summarizes, he says, what a wretched man I am, who can rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What's the solution? Get off the beach. The reason you can't overcome habitual sin is it's not your job. Paul answered his own question of who could rescue him. He said, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God isn't tempting you, he's testing you. You know, in the book of James, he says, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then in 1 Corinthians, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And 2 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Again, what Gerard said, we, if we don't give up our self-dependency, we remain too strong to be of much value. God is testing you to bring you to the point where you rely on him. Uh, Reverend Lawrence O. Richards wrote, this is the last quote here, James reminds us of something utterly important. 
God gives only, quote, good and perfect gifts, unquote. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. This means that the situation in which we feel temptation is in itself good. Even though the evil in us wants to twist it into something evil, in saying every good and perfect gift is from above, James calls on us to radically change our perspective, i.e. see the big picture, and look at the situation we see as, an, as evil, as something wonderful and good. It's only a test. This is a test. It's only a test. God is going to continue to test you over and over and over again until you get it right, until you give him the right answer. The answer is Jesus. It's only a test. So, when you see this big, huge monster of a temptation coming at you, ready to overwhelm you, it's not a temptation. It's a test. It's only a test. And the answer is Jesus. Remember in high school when you'd go in and take a test and you walked out knowing that every single question, you knew the answer? When you're tempted, the answer is Jesus. You know the answer. And when you understand that, you can really appreciate what James said when he, when he wrote that consider it pure joy when trials, when you face trials of many kinds. How can you consider trials joy? Because you know the answer. Get off the beach. See the big picture. The answer is Jesus. Some of those other categories that uh, 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 Gerard had. Sickness. What does scripture say we should do with sickness? Is, yeah, is, if, is anyone among you sick? Then let them call for the elders to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of Jesus, uh, in the name of the Lord. That's what we are told to do. Once you've done that, you can let everything else go. You don't have to continue worrying about it. You've done what scripture said. Get off the beach. Look at the big picture. The answer is Jesus. Personal tragedy. Now, I know a lot of you have, you know, like I do, I've got two sisters that haven't spoken to anybody in the family in over a decade. You know, and it hurts me a lot. I try to reach out to them, but they won't respond. What does scripture say? If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. I've done that. Get off the beach. Look at the big picture. The answer is Jesus. I don't need to worry about whether they respond back or not. That's not my job. That's up to the Lord. It says, you know, Jesus said, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He also said, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? It's not my job. Look at those people that have gone through horrible tragedies. And if you look at it, it looks like there's no solution. You know, how could God let this happen? People like uh, Joni Erickson Tata, championship swimmer, breaks her neck and becomes a quadriplegic. But look at what God has done through her ministry. Jim Elliott, who said, it's no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. Lost his life. But the people that killed him are now some of the strongest Christians. And work with Rich and Alyssa Brown, 
Christian Missionary Alliance missionaries in South America who founded IncaLink, one of the largest evangelical outreach organizations in the continent. Corey Ten Boom, who was sent to a prisoner, uh, to a concentration camp during World War II, and only by a mistake, a clerical error, was she released. She was supposed to be killed. And then afterwards, she showed the world how to forgive through the grace of Jesus. Now, I hope that nobody thinks that I'm trivializing sickness or pain. I know that each of us carries a burden. But a lot of us carry that burden we don't see the big picture. We keep it to ourselves. We are focused on what is happening to us. What does scripture say? Carry each other's burdens, and in that way we will fulfill the law of Christ. You're not meant to carry that pain. We're all here to share one another's pain. That's what the Lord wants. That's the big picture. Get off the beach, see the big picture. The answer is Jesus. Amen. Pastor? Thank you, Michael. Michael came to me last Sunday after the service. He said, you, you said just what I'm going to say. <laughs> and uh, We were just talking about how the Holy Spirit does, puts that together. That's a a great, not even a summarization, but a great addition to the message last week about relying on ourselves. Um, Gary, you may not have, do you have Philippians 4, 8, and 9, Gary? I, I didn't know if I, I knew I, I didn't send the sermon notes to him like I always normally do until this morning when he reminded me, and I don't know if he had that. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask the musicians, the singers to come, and as we, uh, you know, how much, uh, how pertinent it is to uh, the message that we were just challenged with, this song, I need, Lord, I need you. Uh, we need him. It's not about ourselves. It's we need him. Let's read this. And we're going to focus some this year or the next at least half the year on this Philippians passage. Let's read this together. Finally, Amen. brethren, whatever, whatever is true, whatever, whatever is honorable, whatever, whatever is, is right, whatever, whatever is pure, whatever, whatever is lovely, whatever, whatever is of good repute, repute if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. We desperately need the Lord to help us live that passage out. <clears throat>
who is this King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing of his softly spoken words. My conscience of king of glory the king of eternity god i pray that we would allow you to be the king of our lives yes. help us to surrender to you god to be totally reliant upon you yes, lord. god would you speak to us from your word today as we study it as we think about it as we god uh, contemplate what it would say to us yes. give us ears to hear and eyes to see in jesus name amen, amen. thank you you may be seated Let's grab what we need right there. If you have your Bibles, take them. Turn to 2 Chronicles. Chapter 17. 
If the elders aren't more obedient in the future and shorten their talks, <laughs> they're going to be elder messages and pastor challenges. No. <laughs> no, that's okay. I appreciate that, Michael. That's a totally a total joke. Total joke. Don't anybody else, you other elders, take that lightly, though. <laughs> more <laughs> suspect they're going, yay! <laughs> Um, so we uh, have looked at Solomon, we have looked at Jeroboam, and we've looked at Asa, and we come this morning to Asa's son, Jehoshaphat. And right off the bat, we learn that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, and the obvious question is why? What was it about Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat that would cause the Lord to, to really to be with him? Was there something special about Jehoshaphat? And we read in chapter 17, verse 3, the why, the answer, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. One, he sought God. Two, he followed God's commandments. Three, he did not act as Israel did. Allow me to paraphrase. One, he wanted what God wanted. Secondly, he did what God wanted. And he changed like God wanted. You remember from last week what Hananiah the seer had to say to Asa? In uh, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, and you don't have to turn there, just listen, this is one verse. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Understand that wasn't just a one time in one point in time truth about God but it's still relevant today to us. It's still true. Is God still, or his eyes still moving to and fro throughout the earth to see who he may strongly support, Amen. whose hearts? Yeah. Absolutely. We ought, to, we ought to land on that verse and go, I want that in my life. I want to be that. I want God to strongly support me. And that's going to take my heart being completely his. So ties into what we've been, this is not even in my notes, but so we're talking about not being self-reliant. To be totally reliant upon him, that's a heart that's completely his. The heart that's not completely his thinks, mm, I think I can do some of this. While Jehoshaphat wasn't perfect, we do know this. And interestingly, it is Hananiah, the seer's son. We got a generational jump here. It was Hananiah's son who came to, uh, that came to Jehu, or named Jehu, that came to Jehoshaphat and said, you, you, you made a mistake here, Jehoshaphat. You made a mistake. Look at verse 19, chapter 19, verse 3 of 2 Chronicles. But there is some good in you. You made a mistake, but there is some good in you, for you have removed the Ashereth from the land, and secondly, you have set your heart to seek God. Question I turn around and ask myself. Have I removed the things I needed to remove that we've been hearing about? Have I gotten rid of the things that need to be gotten rid of in my life? And secondly, have I set my heart have I determined in my mind and in my thinking that I'm going to seek, I'm going to desire God? If we have, then our lives are going to attest to that. They're not going to, they're not going to go unchanged. We're going, to, we're going to live changed lives. When we begin to say, God, I want to remove the things that need to be removed from my life, and I want to set my heart to desire you and seek you, we're going to change. God's going to change us. His Word, I used to tell my kids when we were going to bed at night, listen, let God's word transform you. Let it change you. Be a, be a young man or young woman of God's word. It, it will change you because it is God's voice to us. So our lives were going to look different than how we lived before we came to know the truth of God. Or even different from how we've been if we've been a faith follower of Christ, but we haven't surrendered all. We've still been hanging on to some self-reliant thing. We're going to start changing even more to his glory and to his praise. So like Jehoshaphat... The seeking, the, the wanting what God wants and desiring the things that God desires will result in accepting and putting into action. I've got that in bold in my notes. Accepting and putting into action the things that God, does, God desires and wants. I can't just know. It's not enough for me to know what God desires and wants. And we fall into that very often. We know that God wants us. We've been reading Philippians 4. It's easy to know those things. It's easy for us to read the verse. Let's just be real. It's altogether another thing to put that into action, to accept that, to receive that, and begin to walk it out in my life. And like taking that passage of Scripture and putting it on my television and putting on the things I read and putting it on my, in my computer and putting it in my car on the, in the radio, 
the things that I'm hearing and receiving, I think we've been lulled to sleep by thinking that those things don't matter. That the stuff of the world, even the stuff, you know, we have our own, you know, MMAP or whatever that's called, Motion Picture Association of America, whatever's rating. We've got our own rating of what is maybe okay. We need to throw our rating scale system out and let God be the rating system. So if what I'm listening to or what I'm watching on the internet, what I'm watching on television isn't pure, it's like, it starts getting real with us, doesn't it? It's like, wow, you know, gratuitous violence, gratuitous profanity, just, and, I, and I'm going to sit and absorb that. I used to tell young people, challenge them, listen, when we go to the theaters and we watch films, guess what the Holy Spirit doesn't do, what he doesn't do? He doesn't check out at the door, Okay. Isn't it, it's almost, it was a very powerful thought for me personally to think that I'm taking the Holy Spirit of God into a theater to be exposed, if you will, to that. I'm not saying the theaters are bad. I'm saying that particular film that should not be consumed by a true Christ follower because there's immorality, whatever else. It's just, you take that, that passage of Scripture from Philippians, it gets ugly with us because there's so much in our lives that, Things that aren't honorable, things that aren't true, things that, and it starts to really put that passage down on your tax form next year as you're filling it out, you know, and just go, wow. I'm not saying we're all cheaters, but there always that temptation, right, to not report. Man, that wasn't enough to report. The government doesn't care about that, do they? <laughs> of course they do. Yes. So, not to get off on that, that's not in the notes. Accepting and putting into motion, okay, the things that God desires and wants. And that acceptance is going to result in life change. In other words, we're going to stop accepting sinful thoughts or behaviors as normal. And we do that a lot. We think, well, everybody struggles with that. So, you know, Paul struggled with sad struggles, so it must be okay. It's okay to understand that we have a warfare going on. There's going to be a battle. It's not okay to think that sin's okay. And it's just, well, you know, it's just the way, you know, God knows we're going to sin. So, you know, I, you've heard that I'll sin and ask for forgiveness. Dangerous, dangerous place to be. It's very, to assume and to presume upon God that he's just uh, willy-nilly, you know, just a sugar daddy and going you know, to throw out forgiveness like it cost him his son's blood and life to pay for my forgiveness and your forgiveness. It's very, very a uh, dangerous place to be to think that I'll go ahead and do it now and ask God to forgive me. It's, uh, there's a hardening that's going to start taking place, and I won't go into that right now. He, you read Hebrews 4, 5, and 6, and it'll satisfy that interest. So we cannot begin to think of uh, sinful thoughts and behaviors as normal that are not pleasing to the Lord. and begin, We need to begin doing things God's way. And it's by doing things God's way we're going to begin to look more and more like Christ. That the world's going to look at my life and look at your life and go, something different about him. There's something different about her. I want what they have. I want what they have. That's a prayer of my God. Make me so different. Make You make me different. Not me make me different. God, you make me different. So that people recognize something different. It may just be a spiritual thing like an aura. I don't know. Whatever the Holy Spirit chooses to do. But that there's something different. That people know something's here. And let it be the Holy Spirit. I desire that it be the Holy Spirit of God. Now may the God of peace, the word tells us in Thessalonians, Paul's writing to the Thessalonian church, and now may the God of peace himself, himself sanctify you. How? Entirely. Entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Incredible that he's able to do that in your life and in mine. Let's take a look at an incident in Jehoshaphat's reign and see exactly what it looks like to put into motion the desire for God. In the Second Chronicles 20, if you will turn over to 20, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon together, and we're familiar, I think we've even looked at this passage, a piece of it recently, together with some of the Meunites came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. Smart guy. And proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. Smart guy. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. This is putting into motion what we know to be true, living it out, 
Then Jehoshaphat, in verse 5, stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, and you are you not God in the heavens? And are you not, and he's doing this rhetorically, obviously, he's making these rhetorical questions, statements. And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Yeah. Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Jump down to verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's just honest talk, isn't it? That's just real honest where we're at. All Judah, and this is just a sweet verse that we, I love these verses that are just like, that's just cool. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. It's like all the people kind of thing. This is Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the two verses that precede what we quoted earlier. Put it into action. Be anxious for nothing, Jehoshaphat. See, anxious, thought or, anxious thoughts are going to come. Aren't, you know, how, Paul, what, what do you mean don't be anxious? Do I not have anxious? You don't have anxious thoughts? I have anxious thoughts. Okay? Anxious thoughts are going to come. It's being human. It's being real. God understands that. I think Jesus had some anxious thoughts in the garden. Okay? It's real. There's nothing sinful about having an anxious thought. What we do with that thought is what is being addressed here. In other words, when your daughter calls you frantically and, and, in, and, and in, a, in a panic and speaking irrational, telling you that she's just been in an accident and is hurting, it causes a dad to have anxious thoughts. Okay? Real anxious thoughts. You know what I found myself doing when I hung up that phone? Because I, I knew help had come because I heard her voice talking to her and she hung up. And I prayed. Okay. Did I have any more anxious thoughts after I prayed? You better know I did. What did I do then? Pray. Not because I was thinking about Philippians 4, because it was my only hope. My only hope. I, w I wasn't hoping for paramedics. I, wasn't hoping for, I was hoping for God to protect my daughter because I didn't know how bad she was hurt. Amen. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't, 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 don't absorb the, the thought. Don't live on the thought. Don't embrace the thought that's anxious. Okay, anxious thoughts come. They're here. What do I do with that anxious thought? I turn to the Lord. And I say, we pray. Okay, we, 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 but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God, please help my daughter, girl. He might help my little girl. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Are there things, are there people, are there circumstances in your life that you, like Jehoshaphat, feel powerless against. Yeah. I can think about those things. In other words, you have, and here's the interesting thing, powerlessness is synonymous with no control. You can't make it go away. You can't do anything about it yourself. Zero. No control over th some of the things that come into our life. That's that powerless. That's that feeling that is Je Jehoshaphat's experiencing that we experience sometimes when these trials of life hit us in the, between the eyes and we don't know what to do because there's nothing we can do. So we don't, we're powerless against this, Jehoshaphat says. But our eyes are on you. Listen, what is God thinking when we come up against powerless feelings and powerless thoughts and powerless situations, things we are powerless against. What is God, what is he, is he scratching his head thinking, oh no, what are we going to do, what am I going to do for Mark now? He's not thinking that at all. In fact, you know what he's doing? He's going, perfect, perfect. Why would I say perfect? Because he wants to show himself great in your life and in mine. Okay, that not that I was able to do something. I didn't get in the car and run over there and tell the paramedics and everything. Here, I'm here. I've got it all covered. Listen, inadequate is a great place to be. Powerless is a great place to be. Weak, Paul tells us, is a great place to be. Because when I'm weak, he's strong. When I'm weak, he is strong. Uh, meek, meek is a good... Everything that the world would probably call lame and weak and pathetic... God says, I'm on it. I'm on it. And it's not that we look like wimpy, meek people running around. People often think, you know, picture Jesus sometimes, you know, just kind of 
walking around like this all day in a robe. He was going into the temple, turning over tables and saying, yeah, yeah, he didn't say that. I'm thinking, you, you trashy people, get, get out of my father's house. This is, you know, you, you thieves. He called them thieves. He didn't mince any words, you know, calling the Pharisees, you whitewashed sepulchers. You know, you're like, you're just like dead people with, you know, just, he was rough. He was tough. But he was truth. And he spoke truth in love. It's that wonderful balance of who God. Throughout the entire history, even to this day that we're standing right here, in God's dealings with his people, listen, he brings them to seas that they cannot pass, wildernesses they cannot evade, walls they can't bring down, giants they can't avoid, diseases they cannot cure, relationships they cannot heal, and ultimately death that they cannot defy. God's been doing that and will continue to do that. Hebrews 11 says that, For what more shall I say? Speaking about faith, speaking about people whose hearts are completely his. For the time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And listen, here's where it starts turning south. And we think, oh, golly, I like those first things, but now wait. I, mm, from weakness were made strong. Uh, mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Listen, women received back their dead from, by resurrection. The others were, here's where it turns, tortured, mm, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. You know, Paul did that when he was in prison. Paul, he could have pulled the trump card as a Roman citizen, you realize that, and he didn't. He could have said from day one, he said, from the, from the moment they started to arrest him on the street, he could have said, hey guys, I'm a Roman citizen. They wouldn't have touched him as a Roman citizen. It wasn't until he was at the end of his imprisonment when they wanted to release him. Please go, please go. He says, time out, uh, I'm a Roman citizen. They're like, they were, they were absolutely scared to death that they'd imprisoned a Roman citizen. It was, you couldn't do it, you should, were not to do that. This is an example here, it says they, was it others, uh, where was I at? Women received back the dead, others were tortured, not accepting their release. What is implied there is that they could have been let free, set free. But they were willing to endure the torture so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom this world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Listen, bad things will continue to happen to God's people as long as we're still breathing in this kingdom of darkness. Don't be surprised, as painful as it is, and as, don't be surprised when bad things happen to God's people. God sees, God sees, and he knows this. He's not taken by surprise, he knows this. Remember that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro on the earth seeking whom he may strongly support, those whose hearts are completely his if I wrap this up, let me leave this with you. Jehoshaphat believed God. He was a man of faith in God. Olympic runners, or runners in general, particularly Olympic runners, particularly marathon runners, and I'm, just, I'm proud to death of my old girl who ran a, the Myrtle Beach Marathon. I'm like, <laughs> she was hurting. She was talking about hurting. She was probably hurt more than she was in this accident. But three things I would say that the core of, of long distance runners is they have a will to run. They have a passion to run. They love running. And they have a determination to run, okay? Those three things, a will, a passion, and a determination. But listen, those are like the legs for runners, okay? The legs for runners. But without legs, you can't run, correct? Faith, I'm going to say, has two legs. And without these two legs, it is, it's powerless. It's a dead faith, James calls it. It's just verbiage. It's like some of the songs we might just sing when we really don't grasp the essence of the song. We're just singing words. It's an empty faith. It's an empty song. It sounds persuasive. And we like to think we have faith, but without these two, these two things, we have no legs. And that's without obedience and trust. We can sing all day, we can think all day, we can read God's word all day, but without putting it into, accepting it and putting it into motion in our lives, we're not getting anywhere. 
we're just idle. We're just sitting in a, in a lazy boy recliner thinking we're running a marathon and we're not. Faith without obedience is simply good intentions, like we've said before. Remember Jehoshaphat's prayer that we read earlier? What happened? What happened? God, we're powerless against this. But our eyes are on you. Second Chronicles 20, verse 14 says, Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jewel. I'm going to skip down. And he said, listen, verse 15, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear. What are you powerless against today? God's saying, don't fear. It's hard, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Or be dismayed because of this multitude, because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. God is on your side. God is in our corner. But listen, even though God says he's in control, he still calls upon us to act. And what does this action entail? Obedience and trust. Verse 16 of Second Chronicles says, Tomorrow, go down against them. They've still got to do something. Go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. And if you continue to read down through that, you come all the way down. Um, there's so much in that passage. I'm going to pick it up in verse 19. The Levites from the sons of Kohathites and the sons of the Korathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. This is after he's spoken. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they had went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. It's great truth. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. It's a parade of praise. May our life look like a parade of praise. And when they began singing and praising, and when, listen, don't miss this, when they began singing and praising, when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes. He inhabits the praise of his people. Amen. He set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, and who had come against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came to the lookout of, to, Judah came to the, lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground. And no one had escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people, verse 25, came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. Listen, whatever you're facing, whatever I'm facing, whatever we're going to face in 2024, we don't know what some of those things are. Trials just kind of trip us up in life. Listen, it may not be the victory you're thinking about, but I'm just going to promise you, and I can tell you this, not because I'm, my word's good for it, but his word is, God's word is. He has the victory. He, whatever, however it may come, whatever you're facing, however it turns out, he's got the victory. I've talked to so many who's, who are dealing with illnesses, I mean, over and over again. You take a Johnny Erickson, Tata, who was mentioned earlier, and, and so many others, a good friend of mine back in West Virginia, they are so thankful for what they had to face, whether it was Parkinson's or whatever, because of what, what, how God used that to bring them into a place of peace and rest and trust in the Lord. They wouldn't have traded that for anything. Take what's in your life that is staring you in the face in defiance of your faith. It is defying you to trust in Jesus. It's, it is challenging you. It's daring you to trust in Jesus and take your stand to obey and trust that God is up to the task. He's up for the battle. Anything less is just Sunday faith. And we don't need Sunday faith. We need week-long faith. We need everyday faith. And my last word to you is this. It's press on. Press on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. God, um, you are good and gracious and kind, and your word is perfect, and it's timely like nothing else. 
I thank you, God, that you, your Holy Spirit, cares enough about being involved in our lives that you want to orchestrate our days. Orchestrate events, God, for your glory and your praise, Father. And it's truly for us because you love us so much. It's not about how, because we're good and deserving, God, but because you're gracious and giving. God, you want us to receive of your grace and your goodness and your gifts and your reward, God, for following you. Help us to, God, help us to get a bigger picture, <laughs> using that phrase, a big picture of what it means to truly, truly live, seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you'll take care of the rest. And we pray this, Father, help us to press on in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to not have that song we were going to sing, singers. Uh, Jim, I'm going to ask you, sir. Jim has asked for the opportunity to speak to us this morning just about something in, in the, that he wants to share with us. Jim, come, please. And... you I won't dig into your <clears throat> your lunch hour too much I asked pastor toward the first part of the week if I could uh, address you and uh, I don't know sometime later on in the week he moved me towards the end I, I don't know if he was thinking I might be going to sing a couple of songs and, <laughs> and deliver a message or something I, I think, though, he wanted me to be the scapegoat that if we helped you too late, that the blame could be mine. <clears throat> I want to start by saying, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for our home, our family, and this, our church family. Most of you know, uh, just a few months ago, I was down and out with twisted bowel surgery that kept me down for about four months. And, uh, but I'm, I'm back up. And then about a month ago, I've been diagnosed with macular degeneration of the left eye, but the good Lord is good the medicines and the doctors have brought my sight back. Uh, and most of you know that Betty just went through a very extensive back surgery. There was lots of tests and uh, things that were ran, getting her ready for this third back surgery by the same neurosurgeon that's been her doctor since 1982. And December the 5th, we took her to the hospital for that surgery. And her surgeon, who had viewed all of her tests, just to preview his own self as to the extensiveness of the surgery, uh, which went from about a two-hour surgery to almost five-hour surgery, she was in the hospital for 16 days, but he noticed a spot on her left lung. That uh, instigated a uh, CAT scan, and they found this mass on her left lung, uh, which also, while she was in the hospital, she was given uh, more tests, biopsies, uh, and found two enlarged nodules, and she's been diagnosed with small cell carcinoma lung cancer. She goes tomorrow and uh, has a port put in. She will start somewhere down the road uh, on chemotherapy and immunotherapies. Uh, she also has a brain scan coming up. She had a PET scan on the 8th, uh, which showed that the cancer has not went to other organs in the body, which we're thankful for. Um, but the PET scan doesn't show the brain area, so they're going to do that 
and then she'll somewhere down the road here shortly she will start the chemo. Having said all of that, um, these are some bumps in the road, some sharp curves that we can't see around. Uh, that's come about just in the last few months, but if we look over the almost uh, next month will be